big welcome as always uh, to our weekly Thursday MPW webinar series. Tonight, creating engaging, in, cre let's start again, creating engagement through compelling content. Uh, delighted to have a very experienced panel with me tonight, a couple of old friends and a new acquaintance. Uh, I'm Chris Robb, uh, CEO and founder of Mass Participation World, for those of you that don't know me. Thanks for joining us wherever you are, uh, late night where, where it is for Tim in New Zealand and early morning people waking up. We generally get a few people in from the US as well. Uh, and our panelists tonight joining us from London, normally in Singapore, but just recently gone up to London. Uh, Lizzie Hamer, Regional Creative Director, Octagon. Hi, Lizzie. Hey, Chris. Great to see you. Mike Jackson, CEO and founder, Constrat, joining us from Singapore. Hi, Mike. Hi, Chris. Good to see you again. And uh, Tim Johnson, co-founder and chief marketing officer, Fresh Sports Group, joining us from Auckland, a very fresh and cold Auckland, I believe. Thanks, Rob. Nice to be here. No, <laughs> hey, Tim. Good to see you. Uh, so just a couple of quick housekeepings. Uh, please stay on mute. Uh, I've got both the Q&A and chat up and I'll be looking at those all the way through. So if you have any questions, please pop them in there and uh, we'll do our best to weave all those into the conversation. Uh, we've allocated an hour. Uh, what I will typically do is I'll summarize just before the hour if we've got a backlog of questions. Uh, we might beg forgiveness to go for another five or ten minutes to try and see if we can get all those covered off for you. Um, and, uh, and then uh, kind of wrap up pretty quickly after that. Just a quick mess mention of, uh, and we've got some of our regulars on here, a couple of the other current Mass Participation World initiatives. Each Monday we have our Strength in Numbers call, 4.30 Singapore time, which is just an open chat room for people from around the world to come and join us. Uh, if you'd like to be part of that, uh, it's usually posted on, on the various platforms, my LinkedIn, Mass Participation World Facebook page, uh, and so on, or just email me directly, chris at chrisrob.asia. Uh, we have been doing some uh, expressions of interest and in almost certainly we'll be coming out with some details in the next week to 10 days, an MPW online summit, most likely in the last week of September. We'll come back with more details shortly. Um, many of you would have seen my aid station interviews. So those are weekly 15, 20 minute interviews with people from all over the world in the industry. Uh, we put out edition episode 70, I think it was yesterday. Uh, an amazing interview with the, um, the president of the Palestine Athletics Federation. Just an incredibly inspirational story. Uh, if you're interested in those, they are hosted on the MPW YouTube channel uh, and Facebook page and LinkedIn and always looking for guests, really trying to cover the globe with those. So if you have any suggestions of people you'd like to hear, please let me know. Uh, these seminars every Thursday. Next week, we have uh, practical guidelines for creating COVID safe plans to maximize your chance of gaining permit approvals. This will be less of a panel, but more of a presentation format. So we have three hugely qualified people, Craig Sheridan from Sheridan Consulting, hugely respected as a risk management person around the world. Hugh Singh uh, from Event Health Management in Australia, but the medical director of the Singapore Marathon, and Marcel Altenberg, crowd scientist from um, Manchester University. So we'll do uh, three presentations with, with them with a view of helping you create your plans. It was out of the feedback that we got last week, people were saying one of their biggest challenges was putting COVID plans in place, COVID safe plans in place and getting permits. Uh, and here, obviously, to help any questions or anything, please feel free to direct, uh, directly email me, chris at chrisrob.asia. I'll just quickly pop that poll in. And as expected, uh, we're mostly from government, uh, from mass participation sports. We do have uh, some people here from government and, and other sports as well. So over the next uh, what's left of the hour, maybe 55 minutes, we're going to go through a, a number of different areas, try and cover off as much as possible. Uh, we're going to, I guess, set the, the, the guidelines to start with or, or have a conversation about what is content. Uh, lots of opinions on what it is, but just to get the opinions of, of, the, of the different uh, panelists. Uh, talk about the role of content versus traditional channels and formats. Um, we're going to look at key factors when considering your content strategy. What makes content compelling? Uh, great to say, you know, compelling content, but uh, how, how do we ensure that it is compelling? Um, and a question, I guess, can you put a framework or process around the creation of compelling content um, and maybe link to that? 
is content uh, an art or a science? Um, we're going to particularly through, through Lizzie's lens, we're going to speak about the power of fandom, how understanding fans, uh, the passion drivers around fans. Uh, we talk about sponsored content. Uh, and then there's some great case studies and one that's even going live that, uh, that Lizzie's working on tonight with Liverpool uh, with uh, something around their victory, a tweet victory uh, activation and engagement. So why don't we get straight into it? And I might start with you, Mike, in terms of uh, what is content, please? Well, thank you, Chris, for that, for that intro. Um, I, think, I, think if, I think it's a really good question to start off with. I think depending on your background and you know, where you've come from, I think content will mean something, I think, slightly different. So let, you give, let me give you my interpretation of, of, of content. I have spent most of my career in the advisory capacity from a media agency, ad agency perspective, advising brands how to spend their communication dollars. Now, from, from that perspective, traditionally, most brands have been looking at advertising. And what I've been trying to do is talk about the role of content versus advertising. So in that respect, I'm trying to get people to shift their money away from traditional advertising budgets into, um, into, into, into content budgets. So I have a particular interpretation of, of how content works in, in that ecosystem. Um, so where, where I've always come from is, is trying to explain the difference between a content program and an advertising program where advertising fundamentally interrupts engaging content that people are trying to watch or listen to or read, whereas content is what people are actually interested in. Um, now, that still, I think, very much takes place uh, today. Uh, and there are still ad units that float around in, in the digital ecosystem that are fundamentally interrupting the content that people are viewing or reading. Um, and the same across uh, linear platforms as well. But if I, if I go a bit more of a deep dive into, into content and, and how we define it further, um, I've always talked about leveraging people's passions and their interests. And, and that can be a wide variety of different things. And that may be everything from, from music to film to sports to dance to cookery to literature whatever it may be, but it's content that people are interested in. It could be news, it could be politics, but what is it that, that, what is it that people are interested in? What are their passions? Um, and from there, we need to really think about what are the right, from a brand perspective, what are the right formats and content formats that we should be creating off the back of that? And that could be anything from blogs to short form video to white papers to long form content to events to activations whatever it may be that we can then engage with our audiences in and then we think about distribution how do we get that content that people are passionate about you know in, in, into their into their environment through certain distribution channels so that's how i've sort of always broken it down rather than just saying it's all about short form video that's working in a social environment we i look at it slightly more macro about well okay how does content differ from advertising and what are the different avenues to explore to get into uh, the broader area of content and content marketing? So that's how I look at it. Thanks, Mike. What's your thoughts on that, Lizzie? I think Mike summarized it really well. Um, I would say content is a bloody good story. Um, however, that story plays out, I think, comes in different forms. So to Mike's point, it definitely doesn't have to just be video. Um, I think there can be sort of a range of different ways that you can have content engage people. And that doesn't necessarily just have to be a one way conversation. Um, we've just seen kind of the huge rise of P with Joe. So Joe Wicks in the UK kind of do this massive P um, fitness kind of regime that sort of blown up around the world. And it was, it was, it started to fit, to feel a lot more kind of conversational and it was going both ways because you could start to see the people interacting with it. So I think content does come in a lot of formats. You just have to work out what that story is and how you can tell it in the most interesting way. Nice, thanks. Tim? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think I, I agree with both of you very much, so, and Lizzie, I like the, the story idea. And for us, certainly storytelling and the narratives is, is really one of the most important parts of, of, of what content is. So whether it's an event uh, uh, property or whether it's a brand, having those different narratives that you're telling around that product or that, that offering is really, really important. Um, so for example, taking a, a concept that we've been heavily involved, heavily involved with the music run, you know, we identified eight different narratives that 
uh, ways and means in which not only customers can come and engage or, or uh, find your event property appealing, but also as ways of, and, and means in which sponsors can actually own specific territories uh, of their conversation. So it's a way of actually drawing people into the brand or into the franchise or into the event property, but it's also a way of, of projecting what those values and those stories are that you're trying to actually communicate to, to, to your audience. Um, and it's also a fantastic way of inviting sponsors and partners of events in particular to actually carve out a piece of territory and carve out that story and weave their own brand within the narrative that, uh, that you're trying to explain or get across to your, your target customer. And, and, and in terms of that conversation, inviting sponsors to be part of it, where, where do you see the, I guess, the responsibility of creating that conversation? It, it, you know, is it brand led? Is it rights holder led? And, you know, are, are people doing a good job of that in terms of in the mass participation industry? Uh, look, it, it really comes from both ends, um, and it, it's a difficult one because one starts with the sales process and going outwards. So it's it's having a really good understanding of your event property. If we're talking about an event property, understanding what the when you dissect the different stories and the narratives that exist that you're trying to tell, whether it's wellness, whether it's performance, whether it's um, you know music or moments or any of the a number of things connected with your event property. Um, that's a way of actually going out to the market and, and selling effectively or inviting sponsors to come and be part of your property through, you know, understanding their own brand and being able to put together a very compelling um, pitch, if you like, for them to carve out a space that aligns with their brand objectives and their values and what they're trying to create. So, for example, if they're a brand that's, that sits in the music space, um, it becomes quite straightforward for, for a property such as the Music Run. If you're in the moment space, uh, you know, knowing your target audience, knowing who, you, you, who, who comes and joins your event and being able to understand what the, the, the emotional and, re and rational benefits are for why they come and attend. And then being able to turn that into a way uh, that invites the sponsor to become involved within that, uh, that narrative you start to become a lot more valuable to them and the sales process becomes a lot easier. So when it comes to actually activating that, that partnership, that's really where the collaboration between, between the parties becomes much more important, where you're getting a very good understanding um, or a deeper understanding of their own brands and what they're trying to do, what their objectives might be for a particular campaign. And then you're showing them and allowing them the territories within your event to enable them to activate that in the most compelling way possible. So together they can assist in then actually telling your brand story or your event property story to their, what is often the case, a larger audience um, through the, the lens of your own event property. So together you can actually end up creating quite compelling content that serves the purposes of the event property um, by way of getting increased awareness, you know, ticket sales, whatever it might be. Um, as well as the partner or sponsor achieving uh, their own brand objectives. Can I, can I just build on that, if I may? Because I think right. what 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 you've just talked about there, there, Tim, is is the is the importance of flexibility um, from a from a rights owner perspective to say, well, look, th this is broadly the positioning that we may have, but if uh, as long as it if if a brand wants to explore a particular narrative that it that links very closely to their messaging and obviously doesn't 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 does doesn't go against exactly what your property is designed to do then there needs to be flexibility to try and find some middle ground in order to find that appropriate narrative and that story to come come to life and i think that's something that i've experienced negotiating on behalf of brands when we've gone into a, a rights owner and said well you're offering me x I, actually i don't really want that what i want is is mm -hmm. is y and we just need, need to com re completely repackage the rights to allow why to have why to happen, but 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 reinforcing the proposition and making sure that the, that your event or the or the, or the rights owner's event is is not in any way uh, you know of detriment. Totally agree, and I think you know having that open mindedness, as as you put it, is really important because for every event property that's trying to to um, you know increase their lifetime value to try and make sure that they're constantly evolving constantly innovating, being open to new sponsorships and new partnerships and new ways of doing things and integrating that into the event experience is, is only a positive. Um, one, because the partners get more value, more benefit out of that. You then, uh, as, as a rights holder, 
are working with them to help improve and, and enhance the product offering and the experiential offering for, for your participants. And, um, you know, net results should be, if you do it well, retaining uh, the integrity of what the event property is all about and the brand values associated with that, but then ensuring that you're constantly evolving and innovating to, to meet the needs of, of not only your partners that are integral to the, you know, the economic model of the, of the, the whole event structure, but also your participants who are constantly changing, constantly searching and seeking for new, uh, new experiences and fresh ideas. Yeah. I think just building on that part is the fans want brands to be integrated really nicely and that, that nothing should be badged anymore. I think we're starting to see the fans sort of saying, if you're going to be a part of the things that I'm passionate about, do it in an authentic way um, and step into something that you either back or believe in or can really sort of show your sort of values through. So I think it's, it's, a, it's kind of a ripe time at the minute where brands are starting to do, build partnerships that are, are more than just sort of putting logos on spaces, which I think just builds into that story piece even more. I mean, you've got a couple of, of, of case studies that you sent through. Do you maybe want to talk about one of those now, that one of the Liverpool ones maybe? For anybody who's not a massive Liverpool fan uh, on this call, um, the Premier League was won last night. The trophy was picked up and held above everybody's heads. Um, and it was a fantastic moment for a lot of fans Um I work with Standard Chartered Bank and they're the major sort of sponsor of Liverpool Football Club. Um, so they uh, talk to their audiences in Asia and Africa, which are definitely not people in the UK and Liverpool. Um, but the nice thing with, with Liverpool Football Club is you've got something ridiculous like 700 million fans outside of the UK. Um, and so that's kind of their engagement is to the people outside of the UK. Um, so a lovely little piece that we did last night when the trophy was lifted, um, we actually took tweets from around the world and printed them on about 500 kgs of confetti and sort of blew that up around the players as they lifted the trophy to give lots of fans their kind of way into sharing their messages of support, considering nobody was allowed in the stadium and never, never mind uh, kind of close to those players. So it was a, a small, it's amazing how a small idea can kind of um, really kind of give a, a lovely way of kind of bringing fans closer to the stuff that they love. So that, that was a big one that kept us up until all hours last night, sort of making that happen and bringing it to life and sharing it with the world. Interesting. Thing. Very nice. That's a great one. Very cool. So, so in terms of, you know, coming back to the, I guess, the, the strategy at the beginning, we, we've spoke about being able to be flexible when you're in the, in the sell process and putting it up, up front rather than it being something that's done later on. But if you're, if you're, a, if you're an organization as an event or people putting on a bunch of events in this space, what, what are the key factors to consider when you're setting your content strategy? Who'd like to go with that? Maybe Tim? Yeah, look, I think with um, the, the way that we've certainly approached it, both as a, as a rights owner, as well as a, an agency working with other um, sports organizations is, is really trying to make sure that you've got some fundamentals in place and your building blocks are there. So it's, it's really understanding, you know, who is your, who is your target audience that you're trying to go after? You know, if you're a new event that's just starting out, it becomes a little bit more challenging to try and make those assumptions. Um, but if you're an existing event, you'll have a lot of insight in, in terms of the data. If you're able to capture that data uh, and understand and dissect it, you'll get a really good understanding of who exactly is your customer profile and, and how has that evolved over time. Um, so making sure you really understand who, that is, who they are uh, is, is really the first step. And then also making sure that you've got um, a really clear understanding of, of your event property and your brand. What are your values? What are your, your, your narratives or your stories that you are um, you know, that you've have ascertained through, um, through the events that you've been doing. Why do people engage with your event? Why do they stay? Why do they come? You know, what, what is it about your event that is, is truly special or magical? And then really trying to turn that into um, what we call a, internally as a, a kind of narrative wagon wheel, which is, um, you know, depending on how many narratives you've got, you know, in some events we've had six and some events we've had, we've had eight narratives. Um, and it's really just trying to, to build out from the core of your brand and your event property, what are those stories or those territories that um, you understand from your consumers and from, from talking to them and listening to them, what are the things that, that um, are the, the stories or the narratives that they find special? 
And those are the ways and means in which it gives you a really clear blueprint to enable you to go and talk to various partners or prospects um, from a from a um, you know from a sales perspective. But also when you go out to market, when you're looking at instigating your marketing campaigns to to sell tickets or um, you know whatever the case may be, if it's not an event property, the same principles apply. Those give you a really good blueprint to say, well, you know, what are the pieces of hero content that we need to create? You know, is wellness the number one narrative? Is that the one that, that sort of over indexes in terms of importance? Um, or is it something like music or is it moments um, as a key thing, depending on what, you know, obviously your event property is. And that gives you a really good place to start when you start to build out what is your content strategy? How are you going to look at the different channels? What's appealing to your audiences? Um, and uh, so it kind of has a two-pronged approach to the way that we focus on it. One is the sales process and the other is the campaign focus as to how can you go out and attract people into your brand. So, you know, for example, on uh, just talking about the music run specifically in, in the context of Malaysia, um, you know, we identified that we had three different uh, consumer segments that we had found from the data that we'd been able to generate over the years of our events. Plus also um, looking at how things have evolved over time. You know, we had experienced seekers, uh, healthy lifestylers and fitness fanatics. So quite a broad spectrum of people spreading, spread across uh, quite a broad spectrum of, of different age groups, demographics, various other, um, uh, you know, segments, segments within that. And what we then worked out was that certain segments of, of these personas were more, uh, you know, certain narratives appealed more, to certain uh, audience segments that we had. So when it came to our content strategy, we ended up looking at things like, for example, um, you know, performance. What does performance mean to somebody in the fitness fanatic category versus somebody as an experience seeker? Um, they're quite different things which determine quite a different content strategy when it comes to that execution. So for us, it became a really important and really uh, you know, scientific in a way um, way of generating content through understanding who our audience was, what were our segments that we're looking at, where do they play, where do they interact, what channels are they interested in, you know, how do we then put content that is most likely to be appealing to them in front of them in a manner in which they, they want to receive that and are more receptive to it. Um, and that's been something that's, that we've found phenomenally successful in terms of the, the construction of our, and the execution of our, you know, digital marketing campaigns. And it really all starts with understanding, you know, firstly, who that consumer is, what are the stories that you're trying to tell, who does it appeal to um, and why, and then how do you put that message or that content in front of them in a format and a time and a place and a manner in which they're most likely to be uh, receptive to it. That's a, that's a wonderful explanation, and you know, obviously, we work with you guys for for a while, and and you know, I think you're at the at the at the higher level of the sophistication there, and and I guess maybe you know, unpacking a little bit of that for 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 people in terms of how how you work some of that out, because I, I'm guessing that there's some people on the call here who might be saying, wow, this is this is you know pretty sophisticated as I know our industry with all due respect but is you know can, can you maybe unpack how you came to some of those a little bit a little bit more of the detail yeah I guess you know as, a, as we started out as, as event property um, uh, you know rights holders it was a lot of trial and error to be quite honest you know yeah. we, we went through a lot of phases of and a lot of different agencies and a lot of different partners that we we're working with a lot of ways of, of doing things and, you know, some of it came from the combination of, of, of our different backgrounds and coming together and finding different solutions of how things could be done better and differently. And, you know, really where we netted out is it, it's, it's got to be about understanding the, the building box or putting a strategic framework in place that has to have everything talking to each other. Um, and that's really centered around the technology. It's centered around the data and it's centered around, you know, your communications. Um, and all of that is, is really revolving around the customer at the center. So for us, you know, the, those are really, really important and critical building blocks that if you don't get all of those pieces of the puzzle in place to start with, you, you know, you, you'll go very heavy on content, but you won't necessarily understand who you're generating the content for or where you're going to put it. And so the effectiveness of that content and the money spent on that content could be absolutely wasted even though it might be the most stunning video or beautiful, you know, campaign or whatever it might be, if you don't understand where it's going and, and why it's going there and the messaging and everything around it, it becomes quite a challenge. 
So for us, that, that took a long time to get to that point where you really understand, get those building blocks in place. So what I mean by technology is, is really it's your platforms and your tools. So your websites, your you know, registration platforms, all of those, um, those mechanisms, making sure you've got all of those building blocks in place before you can then you know, uh, uh, get into a, the, the position of kind of looking at your data which is obviously everything that you've learned about your customers, your, your consumers, your participants. Um, hopefully that's been stored in, a, in an appropriate way. And, and obviously these things are still evolving as far as uh, getting really smart and scientific about what you do with your data, how you segment it, how you store it, how you dissect it, how you can extract those insights. Um, and, and then obviously the communications part is, is super important, which is all about your branding, your design, your messaging, your content production, what messaging and, and, uh, and content are you going to be putting in front of those people? Um, and so for us, those are the kind of building blocks. And if you don't have all pieces of the puzzle talking to each other, you, you really, you're leaving things on the table. So you're letting, you're letting potential prospects fall through the net because you're not understand, understanding where they are or, or how to harness them or how to, to really turn them from a prospect into a, into a converted customer. And then, you know, for us, we, we use that as a, as the kind of building blocks to generate uh, our kind of six step process of, of how we approach really every campaign that we, uh, that we look at, which is you know, starting off with understanding your business objectives. Then you're looking at, uh, you know, analyzing and scoping things out, um, you know, doing desk research, understanding, testing out theories about who your audience are. If you don't have the data, uh, writing personas, you know, who are these people? What are the pen portraits of them? Um, understanding from a strategic point of view, what is your, your technology strategy? What's your customer strategy? What's your data strategy? Uh, what's your communication strategy? And making sure that all pieces of the puzzle are, are, are linked up. So when I say all the pieces of the puzzle are linked up, it sounds incredibly obvious, but making sure that, for example, Facebook is, is um, you know, talking to, uh, you know, your, 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 sorry, your registration platforms are connected to your website, which gets connected to your mail servers, which is connected to your data, um, uh, uh, data lake, if you like, and making sure that all the insights that are coming in from social media channels, from your digital marketing channels, is all being able to be analyzed kind of in real time so that you can make adjustments on the fly to the content that you're actually producing. So, you know, just to give you a, a practical example here, you know, I mentioned the three segments that we looked at with the music run, your experience seekers, uh, fitness fanatics, and, and healthy lifestylers. We would understand the channels that are most likely at the beginning of the campaign to be where these people play. Uh, we would then go and generate content. Let's just take wellness as an example of, of a content narrative that we would generate content for. And we would then go and generate a pool of content that is most likely to be more appealing to our healthy lifestylers, then do the same thing for our fitness fanatics and then do the same thing for our um, experience seekers because wellness means different things to different people. And for a fitness fanatic, it can be much more in terms of, you know, what am I putting into my body? What's the, 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 the nutritional side? How am I, um, you know, it, that's going to be a more appealing piece of content than somebody that's an experience seeker that's like, yeah, you know, this is the first time I'm coming to do a, a 5k run, for example, you know, my idea of wellness is this is it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not even going to run, I'm going to walk around. Um, and they're more interested in, in some of the other narratives. So you, you can play around with the different types of content and through the data and understanding the insights that are coming through in real time from what you're doing in, with your campaign, you can very quickly see, well, you know what, that piece of content is bang on the money or that message or that placement of of, of message or that type or format, you know, video works well for these guys versus static for these guys versus Instagram versus Facebook versus, you know, any number of different things that you'd be looking at throughout the campaign. And it enables you to, to, to just sit back and, and from a creative process point of view, work out exactly what is and isn't working and adjust on the fly. Um, and then go after where, where things are working. Fantastic. Thanks. And, and, and so, you know, that maybe leads us to what is compelling content. Uh, you know, you maybe Lizzie, maybe you want to talk about that one. I mean, how, how do you make it compelling? What are the key elements there that it reduces that trial and error a little bit? Firstly, Tim's got a great strategy there. Like I feel like you've got all the pieces of the puzzle. Yeah. We often say it's the right message to the right person at the right time, but Tim's definitely sounds a lot more strategic. 
Um, so what makes compelling content? Um, to be honest, I often use the word novel. Um, it's pieces of work that you've not seen before um, that give you access to something that you love. Um, that access is, as kind of Mike pointed out at the beginning, it's the stuff, it's the passion that kind of people have for that kind of um, piece, whether it be kind of the sport or the entertainment. Um, and then we always say that kind of uh, a compelling piece of content has got to do one of two things. It's either got to be useful or it's got to be entertaining. Um, entertainment obviously comes in a few different forms. You can feel, you can still be entertained if you're sad, um, but it's uh, certainly a bit more challenging. Um, so yeah, it's, I tend to keep it fairly sort of open for kind of our creative teams to look at novel pieces of work. Um, and with that comes that lovely sort of sprinkling of innovation. Um, so if, if possible, it's always good to kind of look at telling kind of interesting stories with something new that you've never seen or experienced before. Thanks, Mike. Any, any thoughts on that? I will, I will just build on what, what Lizzie said. Um, oh, and, come on, Mike, challenge yeah. me. It's all <laughs> well, wrong. I, I will build on it. I totally get it. Lizzie will come very much from the creative perspective and say, right, we'll go for compelling. What, what, what's the interpretation of compelling? I would also turn it around and say, well, hold on. What are the objectives you're trying to actually achieve here? Because that will actually interpret, well, what is then therefore the output of compelling that you're looking for? So th this is where there's the mixture of the art and the science, in my view, that you're trying to, you're, you're trying to find that right balance because you know, it, it may be a very novel piece of content, but if it doesn't have the actions or the, the brand impact that you're, that you're actually desiring at the end, then it's not delivered on what your brand and communication objectives are. So you've got to disentangle um, and make sure there's a combination of the, of the business and the communication objectives, as well as that real creative spin that allows it to, as Lizzie said, be novel. So that's the, that would be my only build on everything that, that Lizzie said is just, it's just making sure that you've got a hard metric about what actually this piece of content is designed to do. And, you know, and if it is just really nice to look at, but doesn't shift the needle, then I would say that it hasn't actually delivered a, a business objective on the back of it. So that, that balance of art and science is something that, that I, I try and look, look for, but look, you know, you know, the, the, the novel side, I, I look at, um, I think TikTok's a really interesting platform. I think everyone's talking about, um, TikTok, how many of us are actually on it every day or how many, how much of our kids are on it every day probably depends on which generation you're in. But um, TikTok, if you look at, if you go onto TikTok site and, it, and they talk about three things, which is relevant, I think, to, to any content, make it interesting, make a connection and make a trend. That's what they talk about. And I think that applies to so many different things around around content creation make it interesting it, it, it in effect stand out make a trend something that is shareable because i think that is something that we all want something that is novel and and you want to share and and, and then make a connection and make it make it relevant make it authentic make it, make it meaningful and, and and using whatever insight tools that you've got make it something that touches people and whether that is just something that's immensely funny something that's immensely emotional what is it that is going to touch that individual and that audience? And it goes back to the planning process that Tim's talked through, through earlier. And, and, and this is, you know, we, we talk about media plans and media laydowns. It's exactly the same from a content perspective. You need to do a proper content plan with really some thought about what are the insights? You know, what is that content grid? What is that content schedule? You know, how are we in real time, especially if you've got an event that is lasting for three hours, how are you going to have a team of people in real time that are creating and distributing content in the right format on the right platforms and discussing that with people? It, it's a really complex um, area. It's not just about producing one piece of singular piece of content and thinking it'll work on Facebook, it'll work on Instagram, I'll chuck it on TikTok, and then we'll make a long form video off the back of it. It, it just doesn't work like that. So it, it does require people that understand, you might have a great central idea, a creative idea, but interpreting that idea to make it work in different formats that work and, and, and are relevant in different platforms is, is, the, is, is where the key creativity in my mind comes in. I think you've mentioned something spot on there, Mike. Yeah. The, uh, the real-time nature um, of sport and entertainment 
is becoming kind of like the last thing that we all dial into. Um, and I think that bit's fascinating, right? So whether I'm running the race and my family are kind of following me or cheering me on, or if it's the fact that we've all dialed in to watch a certain game, certain tennis match at a certain time gives us this like one moment when it's all happening. I think there's some really powerful content that can come from that. Yeah. I, um, when the, I, sorry, go on. No, you go, Mike. So I, I yeah, what, what I've created in the past when I'm doing whether it's live events, I've actually created something called a four C's, a central content command center. So basically it's people who understand media distribution, creative, social media, whatever it may be that are suddenly picking up a trend or an insight, seeing a great piece of content. How do we repurpose it and push it immediately out? What's the right platform? Um, where do we go? So you have a group of people in real time monitoring whatever the right platforms are uh, working with production teams that are pulling in content then re-editing it as quickly as you possibly can and pushing it out. But it requires, subject to the size of the event, it requires that planning to have a sort of central content team to understand and respond and obviously have that uh, interrelationship with, 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 your, with your audience, which is what they're looking for. Totally. There's this really lovely piece, sorry, Chris, no, okay. where we're right. seeing kind of almost sort of mainstream advertising is sometimes taking second place to this real-time content that can be created. And for me, that rise is really interesting. Um, MasterCard Rugby World Cup was in Japan this year. Fantastic. The piece of work we were able to do um, with, the, with MasterCard was actually a real-time creation of a trophy. Um, so, so the player of the match, at the end of every every match, we would hand over the trophy. But on the trophy, we'd actually laser etched into the metal the story of the match and what that player and the team had done to be able to win that game. Um, and the, the fascinating part is because you were creating in real time, you constantly had different pieces to share. You could involve the fans. Should this highlight of the game go on or should this one? Um, who do you think kind of what were the turning points of the game that this player kind of really impacted or um, managed to create? And then it was that kind of that slightly sweaty palmed moment when you're kind of laser etching just as the final whistle's going and you're running to the pitch to hand over the trophy. But it gave us this real story that MasterCard as an innovation sort of technology brand that they want to be were able to wrap themselves around the game in such a such a fascinating way that it kind of it did feel like you could start to make compelling content in real time. Yeah. Yeah. I think and I think that that, you know, it links into, again, I mean, work that I did quite some time ago. Um, I think it was before I even arrived in Asia. So it was, it was getting back to um, early 2000s. But it demonstrated back then that th this is the way that rights owners need to be more flexible. So I, at, the, at that time, was representing BP. Um, and I ended up on, on a lot of their glo global portfolio, but I was specifically negotiating Castrol's deal with um, Euro two, 2008. So that was actually going back to 2006. Now, I... We, we worked the strategy through earlier and some would say, well, why is Castro moving out of motorsport and into, into football? And there was a, we, we, we worked that very heavily. There were lots of reasons, which I won't go into now, why we wanted to make that shift into football, both internal marketing reasons, but we needed to find that fit. We needed to find what, why would Castro sit with, sit with UEFA when they're previously fundamentally a motorsport brand? Well, it was all around performance. And what we wanted to do was try and really, we created the Castrol Performance Index, which has now manifested itself into various other uh, sports, into rugby, et cetera. But it was all about player performance. And that was the link of, about linking the brand performance with player performance. And we went to UEFA and I went to UEFA and I remember sitting there in Switzerland saying, you know what, all of your perimeter boards that you value at X, I don't want that. What I want is the technology which we want in the stadium to monitor the players. Now, I still had to pay for the perimeter balls. I didn't manage to get a massively, you know, a quite a few million off the rights fee. So I still had to pay for the perimeter balls and they weren't prepared not to give me those. But that was the principal negotiation I went in. So the, the stuff you're selling me, I don't want. What I want to tell the brand story is this technology that you haven't currently got. You get this in, we'll come with you, we'll create the narrative, we'll create the additional content in real time. And then there was this long-standing relationship. So it required the rights owner 
Um, obviously, there was, a, there was a fair amount of money on the table, but it required the flexibility of the rights owner to help us tell our narrative uh, when they hadn't actually thought of that as a, in, in effect, a sole and exclusive that they could go to market. But they realised that there was something in there, and that's now manifested itself into a broader castral strategy across many sports where they look at ongoing performance of, of, uh, of players in real time, and they can feed that back, and there's lots of digital activations they can do off the back of it. Great one. Thank you. So, so in, the, in the mass participation space, we have so much amazing user-generated content, so many great stories that are there. We don't typically have much from a, a broadcast perspective. You know, there's the, the pointy end of the race, which some people say is like watching paint dry in terms of watching the elites. And then sometimes it rolls into the other stuff. Overlaying that with this, you know, amazing user created content of which there is so much. Mike, you spoke about your command center, looking what's out there, repurposing it, pushing it out there. How, how, how does some of that stuff apply in, 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 in relatively small budget events that, you know, we've spoken about some big case studies like Rugby World Cup and Liverpool and, and you know, Tim's spoken about the, the music run. Some kind of ideas of how you can get that content on strategy, repurpose it, get your users creating content that's in line with your strategy rather than a whole bunch of ad hoc stuff? Um, shall I have a, I'll have a quick go at that one and then I'll pass oh. it on to um, probably Lizzie who'll be significantly more creative than me. Um, and then Tim can demonstrate what he actually did. To me, one of the key things is, the, is, the, is, is, is going back to the audience and understanding who your audience are and what are the right platforms and, and, and what is the ecosystem that they, what are the media they're consuming? Because a lot of what I'm seeing, even low budget, is if you've got an endorser, if you've got an influencer that is already really interested in your event, in your activity, they've already got another audience for you. So how do you use their platforms, their audiences, um, their content creation capabilities and create something in partnership with something that allows your event messages to get across. So there may well be ways that it's not all about you and your brand. It's about leveraging on other people who've already got a bigger brand with a different audiences and being creative about how you approach a new audience off the back of it. So I would say you've got to think a little bit laterally about where you want to go and how you want to do it. And if it's not just necessarily about just thinking about Facebook, but it might be thinking about doing something unique. And that's where if your audience is young, and I would say in a lot of these mass participation events, we're talking mainly well, in Asia Pacific, we're talking a lot of 16 to 24 year olds. I would be saying to people, what are you doing in TikTok? Because that's the platform they're using. They've got these hashtag, these brand challenges that they do with brands. They're all on hashtag. There's different ad units that you can use. What can you do with a limited budget, but then start to promote your event using, using something like TikTok, working with perhaps a couple of the races that, that people know, or perhaps getting a, a couple of celebrities in to run that have got a great TikTok following. Just think about your audiences and the platforms, and then, um, uh, and then the, the, the media will perhaps um, help you with your, with your solution. Thanks, Mike. Lizzie, you've, uh, you're back in the hot seat from Mike. No, I was about to say, Tim, tell us how you combined music and running. Because I think the piece that Mike was sort of talking to is like what happens when you bring interesting partnerships together. Yeah, I mean, you know, for those of you that don't know the music run, it's essentially a 5K, uh, you know, fun run, although it has a timed element to it now where you're you're running through five kilometers of, of speakers, you know, speakers placed every, every 30 to 40 meters for five kilometers. Um, we started off the, the journey with the music run, having really user generated content as far as selecting of the, the playlists that were played on the, what we call the soundtrack. Uh, and we evolved the, 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 the concept further over the years to, to ensure that we were actually curating that playlist using experts. So you were using DJs, to come in. So that's a part of a way of actually generating that content, having kind of guest DJs come in to help curate that, uh, that playlist that's going to be played on the track. Um, you know, we had partnerships with radio stations to, to also invite 
their users to to kind of nominate songs that they felt should be on the playlist and trying to create that con that conversation around music and what should be uh, you know on the playlist so that's kind of one element where you're using music and and the the event platform to try and get and stimulate that conversation you know we haven't gone down the tic tac uh, tick tock um route yet tic tac uh, but we uh, we no doubt will in the future i'm sure uh, since it's kind of blown up uh, very much this year um, you know, other elements, you know, once you finish the event at the music run, you've got a, a massive kind of music festival that goes on for, for three or four hours uh, afterwards where, you know, particularly our, our young millennial audience, you mentioned it before, the sweet spots that are 16 to, to 24 year olds, um, you know, they're really into it. They really, uh, we've got a full stage production, um, like with DJs, we've got dancers, we've got music, musicians, we've got the whole shooting box. And so getting uh, getting people and putting those people in front of of the stage, giving them those moments, bringing them up on stage, are really, you know, brilliant ways of trying to get them engaged in, in something that's beyond just, you know, a, a singular event where you turn up and go for a run or do something else. So you're really creating an experience that's that's end to end, kind of five or six hours long, and you're creating so many different moments or opportunities within the context of the fabric of that a whole event structure to give them those opportunities to to generate content, to get content. Um, for themselves, but also to broadcast that to their friends. So it becomes a bit of a, almost a rite of passage sometimes. And we see it all the time where, you know, we've got things like the medal shot, which, you know, for those event organizers um, kind of tuning in, you know, you'll understand how important that medal actually is for people, whether you're, a, you know, a fitness fanatic or an experienced seeker. And so what we've tried to evolve is, you know, what can we do more with the medal? Um, and certainly last year, that was something that we actually engaged uh, a very well-known street artist in Malaysia. We commissioned him uh, to do a um, to, to effectively design the medal out of uh, what was a, a huge billboard of a of a graffiti uh, graffiti billboard, and the medal effectively was part of that whole graffiti um, wall. And so when we were doing the campaign and the lead up, that was obviously a big moment, a big reveal was that what are you racing for this year? So, you know, we had him, you know, very cool kind of production of, of spray painting the wall live. We had it all cut down in, in very bite-sized pieces so you could see the whole thing pieced together. And then, you know, the metal blows out from, from the internal bit and that becomes what people are, are effectively racing for. So the connection between the campaign where you're obviously trying to convert people, get them to buy a ticket, come to the event, and then the experience of when they actually complete the event and, and get the metal at the end of it, turned or sort of connected that journey from end to end in a really, a really interesting way. Um, and the amount of content that we got coming off the back of that was, was extraordinary in terms of the, um, you know, the, the number of posts on Instagram and, and the usual sort of things. Now we wanted to take that a step further and actually um, have that medal even more interactive where we were trying to create a partnership with uh, which, you know, time was, was not on our side on this one, unfortunately, but the idea was, it was a really nice one where we're actually using things like QR codes to, to print in the back of the medal as well, that you could then have that, um, you know, the, the, the playlists and things that were curated for the event become something that people can actually take away with them. Um, you know, use their phone, scan it. And then suddenly the playlist comes, it comes to them from Spotify uh, brought to you by XYZ partner. So there's so many ways of kind of taking these little journeys all the way from a campaign where you're using it to sell tickets, right the way to making it integral into the event experience itself. And then also bring it into the partnership aspect, which, um, you know, we didn't end up doing, but you know, the opportunity was certainly there to do that. So you're taking what I think amounted to a cost of, you know, something in the vicinity of, of five to ten thousand US dollars, including all of the production and everything else, and you're turning it into a piece of content that one you can monetize it through partnerships and, and, and the sales process. Two, you can create use it to to give um, your your audience something that they can actually go out there and, and broadcast to the world. Um, and so it just takes a little bit of thinking about things slightly differently, thinking about all of the the usual aspects of of let's take a mass participation event and say, well, how can I take each micro part of that experience, flip it on its head and do it, some, uh, do it differently? One, can I monetize it to help the economics of the event? And two, how can I, how can I serve that up as a piece of, of content that the users or, or our, our audience or our participants can take and run with? And um, you know, to your point, Mike, which I think is a great one, turn it into something that can trend or be a trend in and of itself. So whether it's just a dance move that you seed into people through influences, whether it's the medal, whether it's something on the t-shirt, 
um, something they take away with them. You know, they're little things that can add up to something quite special, uh, particularly for your subsequent events where people are like, oh, that was awesome last year. That was really cool. What are they going to do next year? So it builds that level of anticipation with how you can actually keep building on um, and, and constantly innovating and doing things differently for, to, to keep things fresh. Fantastic story. Lots of, lots of stuff that's gone well. I, I'd love you to share something that didn't go so well. You said trial and error to start with and stuff that you've learned from. And, you know, maybe, you know, you've all been in this space for a while. And, you know, sometimes we sit here, we talk about all the great stuff, but some of the, some of the learnings often come from the things that, that you've done wrong. What, what might be one of the biggest learnings in terms of, of that process? Talking to me. Um, <laughs> Whoever wants to yeah, take think- it. Lizzie's smiling. She's going to be next. Lizzie, yeah, you go, Lizzie. I've been talking a lot. <laughs> oh, I think this one's always one of those great questions, isn't it? Because um, we can all, we've all got the the things that haven't worked, um, and I, I think you've kind of got to own it, right? Otherwise, uh, you, you never quite sort of move forward. We had a, a cracking one um, talking of kind of content creation. We did a brilliant, a lovely campaign that was. Um, rolled out every month um, new pieces of content. Uh, it was all under kind of an umbrella of the power of numbers. So this number we would look at as a number seven and it represented X, Y, Z. This number's 11, it represented X, Y, Z. And every number we did just got, the project got bigger and bigger and bigger. So we ended up like, oh, for the first one, we'll just make a short film. For the second one, we're gonna make a, we're gonna write a whole children's book and we're gonna do this and we're gonna make a film about it. And by the time we got to the end of the year, I think I'd blown up my entire team and they were like, oh, enough with the content, please. Mm -hmm. So I think there's some really strong learnings about making sure that you can like scale your team as well as your your understanding of what you're trying to produce and put out there. I think it's a really good point, Lizzie. I think the, um, sorry, just to jump okay. in, I think you, you've hit the nail on the head with one thing and that's simplicity. You know, so, so often the best ideas are the ones that are just so simple that people can grasp it, they can grab it and they can, they can run with it. Um, you know, there's so many things that, that sound great on paper and strategically they're amazing and all of these wonderful things and you can see it all come together. And, but when you try and actually activate it, it, it you know, the loss in translation thing can be a big problem. Um, and you can overcomplicate things, especially when you're trying to, to, to put on events for lots and lots of people and there's lots of moving parts. It, uh, simplicity is often the best way. Wow. Mike? Uh, and I think the, I would just build on that and, and I would say, don't be prepared, um, be prepared to fail. Because I think the, you know, I, I could tell you hundreds of stories of things that have gone horribly wrong on shoots or on, big macro deals. It's then about how you, how you respond to that because it, it is, it's, it's going to be about demonstrating flexibility, about do as much planning as you possibly can. Things will, you know, whenever you're going, you know, in a live event, I'm sure, you know, the, the live event community will know that there'll always be things that, that are challenging. Um, but if you don't push the boundaries and you don't learn from that, you'll then never be able to improve. And, you know, and I'm sure that, you know, what you guys have done, Tim, you know, you've got to a stage where you've now got a sophisticated, you know, model of how all of these things interconnect and what your content plan is and your scheduling and your distribution strategy. But you've only got there over, over, over a few years and learned year on year what's worked and, not, and what's not worked. And I think that having information and insight and data to support well actually we could do things better to get these results is really important to that learning to that learning process but if you don't try you'll never learn from it and you'll never then move forward um and i think that there are plenty of examples there to, that, that we can go into that you know that, that just 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 have a go just have a go and see what happens yeah and i think maybe just the last thing on that i, I my, my sense is that sometimes people are kind of overwhelmed with the need for high level production costs, high production costs, high production values, where that, 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 that's certainly not necessarily the case, is it? <clears throat> well, well, well not, not at all. I mean, this is where if you look at the social platforms and if you look at try and create something that actually is a user generated content, you're not creating the content, you're creating a concept that then the content is actually being created by your audiences. So, you know, and, and even if I look at, if you look at somebody like Nike, they, they, they're shooting stuff on the phone and they're just doing a couple of little creative things in post. And, you know, you do not need huge production budgets. You just need a great creative concept, nicely executed, and then allow people to engage with it and then create their own, journey, their, own their own content off that. And then you've, then you've created a trend that, that, that's shareable. So you just need to have that great idea, that nugget, 
you don't need, I don't think, huge production budgets anymore. Thanks, Mike. Folks, I think we're pretty much out of time, so I might just pick up some of the nuggets um, that we went through. Um, I love Lizzie's, uh, Libby's defi definition of, uh, of content, a bloody good story, but make sure that it's two-way. It's, uh, it's not just a, a one-way conversation. Um, the flexibility of, of rights owners, uh, the point that Mike made, and, and, and I think it's been repeated by a number of people that uh, you know, there's, there's great opportunities if you're prepared to be flexible. Get the building blocks right. I mean, I loved all the, the insights that you gave there, Tim. Uh, so, many, so many great building blocks, and clearly you guys have built uh, a, an amazing content plan that I, I think would, uh, you know, so many people could learn from, and, and I know that you guys do some work with, uh, with other events, so giving you a little bit of a plug, as does, as does Mike and the consulting in that space. Uh, create a trend, look at something, whether it might be a new dance move, uh, you know, uh, something around that. Uh, what's your platform being very clear and you know Mike's comment on in, in terms of our industry mass participation industry how many of us are using TikTok um, one of the things I've just realized as I do that which was a poll that Mike was interested I'm just going to throw it out as we wrap up in terms of uh, how many what people see in terms of their content budget um, creating moments and, and I think the reality is that sometimes we don't even have to work that hard to create moments in our industry don't we there are so many amazing moments that happen by accident but are we capturing those and, and, and creating the mechanisms to be able to to capture them uh, sim simplicity I, th I heard authenticity a lot of times through here uh, be prepared to fail um, and I guess that's not just in content but it's in in, in all other aspects of, of our event uh, of our, our industry. Uh, some really great insights. Uh, just going to quickly end this poll and show it out there, which is, is interesting uh, that some people see that 100% of their budget should be spent, which will, uh, uh, will make you, you guys proud and happy, I guess. But some, some fairly high numbers there in terms of uh, a couple of people. Actually, no, not so good. Less than 10% is, uh, is, is, is interesting. So hopefully you're going to go away from here even though there's a couple that say 100%, you're going to go away from here and recognize the, the great value that this audience has brought, even though you're saying less than 10% now. I'm guessing we need to convince you a little bit more, hey? <laughs> Folks, um, thank you so much for your, your time, all those that have tuned in. Thanks, uh, Lizzie Hamer joining us from London, uh, Tim Johnston from Auckland, and Mike Jackson from Singapore. Thanks so much. Um, this is, uh, has been recorded live on Facebook, so if uh, you've got colleagues that missed it, um, it it'll be up there for, for obviously a long time. And uh, go and see it on the YouTube channel, Mass Participation World. Thanks so much. Have a great morning, evening, night, wherever you are. Thank you. Thanks for Thank having you. us. Thanks, everyone. Bye.